this morning on the Liberty Works Radio Network. That's the Eagle 104.3 FM in Tampa, now Cali. The title of the message this morning is Jesus is the Reason. Jesus is the Reason. So we're going to start this morning in Matthew chapter 1. And in Matthew chapter 1, starting uh, with uh, verse... Actually, we're going to start with verse 16. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now, you'll notice something here. Uh, Matthew was very, very careful not to say that Joseph begat Jesus. And that's what your New Age Bibles will tell you. They, they uh, will say that they refer to uh, Mary is his mother and Joseph is his father. Uh, where, the God, where the Bible, the King James Bible, refers to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Joseph. And so we read here So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ. Are 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now in those days, when you were espoused, folks, let me tell you something, there was more than what we have today, if you're engaged today. Today, if you're engaged, uh, you can break off an engagement by simply saying, you know, I'm, I went out of this. But in those days, it was the same as being married. Uh, uh, the only difference, you hadn't consummated the marriage. So in order to, to break off the engagement, the espousal, you had to go to uh, court of that day to do that. And so here now, she was found with child by the Holy Ghost. Uh, now, in those days, a woman could be stoned to death uh, if she was found guilty of adultery. And so, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. In other words, Joseph loved her very much. And uh, he, he more than likely figured, well, uh, she was sleeping with somebody. You know, he, and so he was going to put her away privately because he loved her, not to embarrass her. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now, it's an interesting thing. You know, usually where you have uh, the angel of the Lord, that is usually a theology. Theophany or Christophany. Right. Christophany is, is when the Lord Jesus appears in some form, a human form. And uh, here, he appeared actually in this dream. Uh, he not hear him say, thus say, or the Lord. He is speaking with authority. And he is speaking <coughs> here as the Lord. And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, the Hebrew for Jesus is Yahushua, Yahushua. 
the Yeshua, as some will say, meaning Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. Mm -hmm. And here, in fact, uh, the name, there's 144 references in the Bible of the Old Testament alone uh, to the name of Jesus. 144 different ones. <clears throat> All the names of Christ. I want to turn over here uh, to Genesis chapter 3. If we go back to verse 8, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when his mother Mary was his mother. In Genesis chapter 3, now this was 4,000 years prior here, verses 15 and 16. Now, often you will hear uh, about the Immaculate Conception. Well, most people don't understand this. What is referred to as the Immaculate Conception by the Catholic Church is, is not the conception of Christ. They'll tell you that it was the Immaculate Conception was the conception of Mary, okay, uh, in, a, in a sinless state, which is absolutely not true, okay, according to God's Word and Bible, and according to Mary, because it was Mary who said that uh, Jesus was her Savior, folks, and only a sinner needs a Savior, right? That's right. And so, if we go to Genesis chapter 3, here's the miraculous part. Starting in verse uh, 15. And I will put enmity between the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Well, he's referring to the seed of the Satan and the seed of the woman. Now, here's the miraculous part and all that. A woman, a woman doesn't have a seed. A woman doesn't have a seed. And so what is he referring to? He's referring to uh, something that's miraculously real immaculate conception is the implantation in the womb of Mary by the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's the real immaculate conception. <clears throat> I will put enmity between the woman and between thy seed and her seed. And she'll bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception and sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to the husband, and he shall rule over thee today. Well, prior to their fall, there would not have been any pain in conception. Or there would not have been pain in childbearing. But today it can be painful, right? You ladies know that. And I always laugh when I think about what some of the uh, <laughs> the New Age Church teaches, the prosperity preachers teach on that, where they actually uh, taught uh, Kenneth Copeland that in the beginning women were to give birth out of their side instead of you know the way the natural way, and they say that because that. Eve came out of the side of Adam, and that from that point on, uh, people were to come out of the side of the woman. Okay? Now, in my opinion, that would be very painful. Okay? To come to me. So, anyhow, we go back to uh, where we left off. Well, you know what? Before we do that, let's go over to uh, Jeremiah chapter 31. And in Jeremiah 31, we read something as well verses 21 and 22. How long wilt thou go about, O thou backsliding daughter? For the Lord hath created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as yet they shall use this speech in the land of Judah and in the cities thereof and I shall bring again their captivity. And the Lord will bless the habitation of justice, the mountain of holiness. Now here, here now, this according to ancient theologians has a number of applications. There's a, an old German Bible, it's the Billeberger Bible. It's really got some interesting con commentary in it. But uh, here, uh, the woman here, uh, will conceive what it says a woman will encompass a man 
And what that means is Mary, the first application, uh, encompassed. So encompass means to be surrounding uh, a pre-existent person, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was, was in existence from ancient times, became a, a babe in the womb, but it was the same Christ, the same uh, second person of the Trinity. And he was encompassed by a woman. Here, he who encompassed the entire universe out there. And then, the uh, he will, the woman also, the second application is the Church of Israel. The church, the, the first Jewish church of believers, uh, they were, would encompass, Christ would come out of there. Christ would be, come out of Israel. And Israel is referred to as the wife of God. So it has all of these different applications there in that one verse. And then here uh, he talks about bringing about a new covenant. A new covenant. And so I want to go back to where we left off there in Matthew chapter 12. Or, or Matthew chapter 1 rather. And we pick it up. Verse 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of by the Lord. The prophet said, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth the son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted as God with us. Of course, that's in Isaiah 7, uh, verse 14. Now, by the way, that word there that they're using, there's two words for, for that and the one used in, in Isaiah 14 is Alma, Alma, because <clears throat> the new translations and a lot of the liberals have said they've changed that from a virgin uh, simply to an unmarried woman. Which is like they've changed everything. No, the word means, strictly means a virgin. Amen. And in fact, it's the very same word, Parthenos in the Greek, which means strictly a, a virgin. And then he goes on uh, to say, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, and being interpreted God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from the sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. And he knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son. He called his name Jesus. Now look, now, again, the different teachings on that. Uh, some of the Seventh-day Adventists teach that Jesus, instead of being the oldest child, was the youngest. Uh, that Mary had been married previously, to, or Joseph had been married previously to another woman and had those six children by her. Uh, that there's no evidence, nothing in, in the Word of God that, that teaches that. That's, that's man's teaching, that's dogmas. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that uh, that, that word brother in there doesn't mean um, of the same womb. And yet, that's what that word does mean there, uh, of the same womb. <laughs> Adophilus, Adophilus, which means of the same womb. And so, here now, Jesus was the oldest and he said, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn. So in other words, uh, she was kept a virgin until um, after Jesus was born. And then she did what she was instructed to do in God's Word, the Bible, to be a good wife and, and be fruitful and bring forth children. Now that's what the Bible teaches. And again, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that uh, uh, that that doesn't mean brothers or sisters, it means cousins, just relatives. And yet, folks, as we go through here, we'll see how that just doesn't square. In fact, if you go to, I'm going to go over with Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and read verses 5 through 11. <coughs> Let us be in you which was also in Christ Jesus 
who being in the form of God, thought it not proper to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found as a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, unto the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That name which is above every name. That in the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, again, there's only one name, folks, and we see this today so prevalent. The world could care less. You could preach in anybody's name. Only one name that really aggravates the world out there. I mean, you don't see any city council people say, we passed a resolution, no praying in the name of Buddha or, or the name of Muhammad or whatever. But Jesus, Jesus, all of the atheists out there, uh, who do they attack? Jesus. Now, what does that mean? You see, the opposition knows who the real Savior is. Okay, they know. Okay, just like there's only one Bible that they attack continuously. That's the King James Bible. Right. You know, all of them attack the King James Bible. Guess what? What else do they attack? Fundamentalism. Fundamentalism. Uh, Recently, that the Pope came out condemned fundamentalism. Yes, he did. Okay, yeah. And why is that? Because we hold to literally the Word of God. Amen. And so, I want to, I want to and I'll take you back. And the other thing too, <coughs> verse ten. This is an interesting thing. That the name at the name of Jesus, every nation bow things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that has two applications. Okay, a lot of people believe that, you know, the, of course, we know uh, that the lake of fire is a physical place. Hell uh, is a state of being, being in, in total torment. But another application to that is, uh, I was just watching the, some of the history that, that they found underneath Berlin, they had built, Hitler had built a huge, huge complex underneath the city. And that... That was just recently discovered, okay? I mean, uh, unbelievable, but I know in Moscow, they say that there is a city under Moscow that's, that's bigger than Moscow, that's larger than Moscow. And here, and more and more in Australia, uh, we know that it's quite common to build cities underground there, okay? Uh, and they use, uh, they use the climate underground states about 70 degrees all the time. And so it's an interesting thing, because way back when this was written, uh, obviously God's word, the Bible knew, this is where he said, those above the ground are under the ground. God says that he gets it done every time. Amen? Amen. Well, uh, going back to where we were in Matthew, <coughs> verse 25. And he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Again, he knew her not. If you go over, in fact, to Matthew chapter 12, and in Matthew chapter 12, I want you to read. Again, that word there that we use, verses 46 through 50. While you yet talked, while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring uh, to speak with him. Now, that word again, Delphos, what we said, means a brother of the same womb. A brother of the same womb. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brother stand without desiring to speak to thee. <coughs> but he answered and said unto him, that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brother? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciple and said, Behold my mother and my brother, for whosoever shall do the will of, of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Now, I was reading and I thought it very interesting, some commentary. And from that old Bible I was telling you about, and they were saying how... Uh, 
Mary would, would press Jesus uh, and where she would be out of line. I think that's really making some judgment calls that are out of line uh, to try to judge why why Mary did this. If you know at the wedding of Canaan, she told him to, uh, you know, to make, you know, whatever he tells you to do. And when he says, woman, woman, my time is not yet, um, he's making a point. And the point that he was making right here was, look, I came into the world in a physical body, but folks, I was before the world was. I was the one that created that world, you see. And I'm not like the rest of you. I, I serve my purpose. But you see, uh, those that are my brothers, and he's using that word now in an internal sense, just like all of us have family members that are not saved. And yet here today, we have a large family. Take a look around. These are your brothers and sisters. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what the Lord was referring to, that those of you out there, all that do the will of his Father, those are his true brothers and sisters. Remember, and you know, at that time, his brothers had not accepted him. His brothers had not accepted him as being the Savior. He had to what? Raise he had to raise himself from the dead. And then they were believers. Okay? So he's making that point to these people there. Going back uh, to Matthew chapter 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. It's an interesting thing because they have found, not too long ago, they found a number of these wine jars. And uh, the wine jars had the inscription, Herod on them, Herod the king of the Jews. And here, uh, these magi, they came from the east. Now, let me tell you about these magi. They, they were Persians. And they were referred to wise men. They, they followed astrology and astronomy. And they came from the east. Now remember, Herod had proclaimed himself to be the king of all the Jews. And now, here they come to him. And remember something else at this time too. Persia uh, was the only country out there that had not been occupied by the Romans. They had not been subjugated by the Romans at this point. So, in fact... At that time, when this was taking place, historians will tell you uh, that the Persian army was was considered to be threatening the east of the Roman Empire, right. saying, "Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him." You know, that's another verse where it says that the Gentiles will see a great light. Now, Herod, remember, he considered himself to be the king. By the way, uh, this Herod, uh, he was a, a pretty ruthless individual. Oh, yeah. He had a number of wives. And the one wife, uh, he killed her and her three sons that he had by her. Uh, he, they were the ones that were next in line, the one to take his throne. And so... Uh, you know, he had her killed, and all three of them. Now, you know, that's, that's pretty ruthless to kill your own children uh, to keep them from getting your throne, right? And Jezebel's daughter did that. When her son, the king, died, she killed all of her grandchildren except for the one who they snuck out, okay? And uh, he was able to come back. So... So he says, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. Now when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. And all of Jerusalem with him. Now remember, these men had a lot of influence. They were uh, very influential. And Herod knew that if these three wise men, if you will, uh, were to be referring to somebody else's king, well then maybe... There was more to it than that. Maybe they were planning on overthrowing and, and, and placing this new king on the throne. 
And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where uh, Christ should be born. He should have known that, right? And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor, and they shall rule my people. In fact, uh, if you go over to Micah, in Micah chapter 5, now this was written 700 years before the birth of our Lord Jesus. In verse 1 we read this, Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He had laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon his cheek. Well, obviously he's referring to who is going to be the judge of Israel. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to be the true judge. And they were referring to back then, 700 years before his birth, about his impending crucifixion. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me. That is to be a ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old to everlasting. So, and then the next verse tells you that they're going to reject him. Therefore will he give them up until that time she which travaileth hath brought forth, and the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. Well, here again, it makes a re reference to of him, to the pre-existent Christ. Uh, these things, you know, today, you know, when you, when you think about people talking about technology, they're all talking about these little watches now that you wear on the wrist and all of that stuff. All of this technology we have today, I mean all of it, is child's play. If you consider the miraculous things that this word the Bible is talking about. Is it, I mean, think about that. All of these things were said, they, they came down exactly the way he said they were. 700 years before he's born, exactly when, exactly where, exactly how. Okay. And yet, there are people out there that say Jesus was a great magician and he was able to, uh, to pull these things off, that it was trickery. Can you imagine? How many of you in here think that you could have had any, uh, any ability to, uh, in any way, uh, well, I, I guess, decide on when you would be born? I don't think that, that's possible, right? Because uh, to a liberal, this might not make sense, but before you existed, you didn't exist. Now, that might be confusing to a little <laughs> I mean, because everything is, is upside down, inside out, and backwards. You know, with a, I was just thinking about that today. With, they've got this big thing they've been talking about, this epidemic of rape on college campuses. And then they're finding out that all of these, these rapes are not, not rapes, because these girls have gone to these counselors, and these counselors have convinced these girls that they were raped, when the girls didn't know that they were raped. Uh, some years ago we had a, a woman came on a radio program and her husband had gone to prison because he was convicted of, of uh, raping uh, 10 other women in his church. Now the, the problem was the very same problem. He was having affairs with these women, all of them. His wife knew about it. She was the one that was there in Brooklyn. Uh, and she knew that, that, that it was it was conceptual, right? Well, remember that's about the time the Victims Fund came into being. Where if you were a victim, there was some money for you. Well, these uh, counselors got a hold of these women and convinced all ten of them that they'd been being raped. They didn't know, it, you see. But this guy, they said he... He's so good, he's such a good con man, he was just taking advantage of you. Now, do you think maybe that money had a little influence on in all that? What does Solomon say? Money answers with all things. And I say, you're telling me, I couldn't believe this. Some of you might remember that program. But that's how absolutely ludicrous political correctness is. 
Going back to where we left off there. And when, verse 7, Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go search diligently for the young child. And when we have found him, bring him bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, kind of like Killer George Killer. Say, bring your baby in so I can take care of you. <laughs> and when they heard the king saying, they departed, and lo, the star which in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And again, that goes to the prophecy that the Gentiles will see a great light. Mm. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, it's an interesting thing because all three of these gifts have a meaning. The gold indicates his kingdom, that he was his, his kingly kingdom. The frankincense uh, represents his priesthood, his royal priesthood. Uh, the fact that Jesus Christ is going to be king of kings, lord of lords, and that right now today uh, he is interceding for us at the right hand of the Father every day. Amen. Now, you see, the office of the priest and the prophet were two different offices. The office of the prophet was the prophet went before the people in behalf of God and said, Thus saith the Lord God. But the priest went before God on behalf of the people to intercede, to pray for him. And so the Lord Jesus is doing that. He's the royal high priest. And then myrrh, well, that represents the death, his death, that he would die and he would suffer and die to take away our sins. And when they, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Well, I could tell old Herod was not very happy with these three fellows at all. And, uh, and when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there, and bring thee word of Herod, and will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord of the prophet saying out of Egypt have I called my son but you'll notice something going back there uh, and when they were coming to the house you'll often see the nativity scenes out there you see uh, Mary and Joseph and the baby in the manger and then you see the three wise men it what didn't happen that way. Uh, the child was about two years old uh, when the wise men found him, caught up with him. He was about two years old. And he wasn't, they no longer was in, a, he was, they had found themselves a house and they were living in a house then. Um, so that depiction, there's so many depictions that you have today that uh, are not the way they were. Uh, you often see this, the Last Supper. You'll see this table sitting there at the Last Supper, and you'll see these disciples, and if you look closely on there, some of these uh, so-called disciples are women. Why well, do you know that? Well, they're sitting there, they don't have beards. Uh, it was required, the young Jewish men had to have beards, okay? And uh, if those women had beards, <laughs> they were in the wrong place. <laughs> but. You know, that is another one. You often see the picture of Jesus with his long hair. And even, you got 
people today, men who want to look like, and they think that uh, that they are representing him, or they appear as Jesus did with his long hair down past his shoulders. Well, no, uh, that's not the way it was. His hair uh, was was short. It was like about the average man's hair today. How do you know that? Well, if you take a look, here's a couple reasons. Well, if you go back and you take a look at all the busts back of, of those people back in those days, uh, you'll notice that the, of all the Romans, uh, they all had hair which is about like the hair of men today, and they were clean shaven. Yep. All the Jewish, they had the same thing. The hair about like the way men wear their hair today, but they all had beards. And the only people in those days uh, that had long hair were the male prostitutes, which were referred to homosexuals, which were referred to as dogs. Or the other ones were the mercenaries that from Germany, the barbarians that served in the Roman army. They have long hair. The Apostle Paul himself said, Does not even nature itself tell you that it's a shame for a man to have long hair? Amen. The word used there is komea, the Greek word for a woman's hair, komea. Now, do you, let me ask you this. Do you think the Apostle Paul would have said that if Jesus had had long hair down past his shoulders? No, no you see? <laughs> Paul saw the light earlier in the road to Damascus and he wasn't going to get into any more disagreements with the Lord. Okay. Now he'd learned. He'd learned a lot. And so a lot of these, these things that you see, these depictions, are not biblical. The others, you'll often see uh, uh, pictures of uh, these seraphims <coughs> looking like little babies with wings flying all around. Folks, again, that is somebody's conception. It's not, not out of God's Word, the Bible, at all. So, uh, going back to where we left off. Where did I leave off, Dale? Okay. Uh, 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth. And he sent forth and he slew the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coast thereof from two years old, and according to the time when he had uh, diligently required of the wise men. Well, Herod died in 4 B.C., which meant that Jesus was probably born around 6 B.C. Uh, so, and, and so Herod knew that Jesus would be about two years old from the time that the wise men had first come to see him. And this was a film that was spoken of by Jeremy or Jeremiah the prophet saying, In Ramah was there a loud, there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning for Rachel for her children. It would not be comforted because they are not. Turn over in your Bible uh, to uh, Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah chapter 31, <coughs> verses 15 and 16. Thus saith the Lord, by the way, this was written almost 700 years before his work. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children refused to be comforted for her because they were not. Thus saith the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping, and thy eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded for the Lord, and they shall come from the land of the enemy. So again, that prophecy in Matthew was fulfilled there in verse 18. Or that, that prophecy from Jeremiah was fulfilled. And, and I'm going to be, Lord's willing, after the first of the year, preaching on the new covenant. There's a lot of confusion about this new covenant for people out there. And so we're going to take a close look and take it to a little bit higher level than normal. So going back over to uh, Matthew chapter 2. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel. For they are dead which sought thy young child's life. 
And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside and went to the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. He should be called a Nazareth. But it's an interesting thing, if you go over to John chapter 1, <clears throat> John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, finding Philip, and said unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was a Beth, a Beth city, of, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth the things, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the wall and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said unto him, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. And Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. And Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi! Thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest that thou shalt see greater things than these. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And then, Going back to where we started, I just want to jump back here. To Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. That was done. Remember, these things happened some 800 years. These prophecies were made before the birth of Christ. In verse, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counsel. You know, this doesn't... This is confusing to people that, that don't study the Word of God. See, people that don't understand. Christ is the head of the church. We are the body of Christ. We're the shoulders. Amen. The Bible says that the government's going to be upon Christians, upon His people. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed, folks, that the government's not real friendly towards us? Uh, yeah. And his name should be called the Wonderful Counselor. Now, that's an interesting thing. In John chapter 7, verse 46, do you remember what they said? When he had sent, when the Pharisees and the Sadducees had sent the soldiers out to get the apostles, they came back and they said, Never has a man spoken like this man. In other words, never has there been anyone that spoke with, with absolute authority, absolute surety, and with absolute wisdom like this Jesus. And it says, the mighty God, well, uh, the mighty God, that talked about the fact that he was God, the Son, the Son of God. The everlasting Father, now, what that really means is the Father of Eternity. Father of Eternity. And the Prince of Peace, folks, guess what? <laughs> All of my life, I've been hearing them talking about having peace accords, peace accords, peace accords over in Israel. All of these years they've been having these peace accords. Guess what? They've never had any peace. Nope. Right? Do you know why you can't have peace? You can't have peace until you have the Prince of Peace. Now, he tells you right in here. You see, if these people had been reading the Word of God, they could have 
they could have saved themselves many, many years, right? They could have saved themselves 70 years of futility because the Word of God makes it very clear. There will be no peace until the Prince of Peace comes. There will be a false peace for a very short time. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what the Word of God says will happen. And of the increase of his government and peace, there should be no end upon the throne of David and upon the kingdom. Stop it. In order. And to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. Amen. Every place through scripture, folks, it says, where the Lord says, I have said it and I will do it. Guess what? He said it and he's always done it. And that's the end of that. We've been coming to the Word Baptist Church, 14781 Sperry Road, in Newberry, Ohio. And the next week, we want to say good morning, God bless, and remember, always, always, keep fighting the fight. Amen. Amen. Great job, Kevin. <laughs> 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 <laughs>